Hi everyone, welcome back. So we're just gonna um, give some time for people to join in on our live. And um, while we wait, we are gonna share some fun marine science that was in the news recently. Yeah, so some biologists off of Mexico have recently, or they think they recently discovered a new species of beaked whale. Yeah, they originally thought this was just an endangered species that hasn't been found in a while, but after collecting some acoustic data, they think otherwise. So whales actually, they echolocate to find their food um, and also to communicate with each other, so this can be a distinguishing factor in determining a new species of whale, which is exciting. Yeah, and they actually collected some DNA samples that they're still processing just um, to hopefully verify this new finding. Yeah, it's very exciting because <laughs> something, you know, as big as a whale has gone undiscovered by scientists. So you can only imagine, like, what else is in the ocean? Mm -hmm. All those oh, little things exciting. out there. <laughs> yeah. It's a whole nother world. Yeah, so we're just waiting for people to join. It looks like we have Meredith here. Hello, Quinn. Quinn. I think I saw my mom. Hi, mom. Yeah, thanks for joining. <laughs> and just a reminder, this is our fourth live stream. Um, all of the other ones are still on the Point Blue Facebook page under videos, mm -hmm. in case you missed it. Yeah. And if you tuned in for all four, <laughs> go you. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Sarah. Hi, Lishka. Hi. Thanks for joining. Hey. And just a reminder, we have our donate link. Um, we do that. There. Can you all see that link? <laughs> Hello, Ash. Oh, hi, Ash. Hi, Dylan. <laughs> Thanks for joining, everybody. All right. Guess we can get started. Yeah, we're going to get started. So, hi, everyone. I'm Olivia. I'm Rebecca. And I started here back in September of last year after graduating from California State University, Monterey Bay, uh, where I also played water polo and I also did electric chemistry research for two years. Um, and a part of that research program, I got to go on an amazing research cruise with the National Marine Sanctuaries, and that's where actually I met Point Blue scientists. Um, and yeah, since being here, I kind of wanted to shift my research to more uh, marine biology, uh, and I look forward to hopefully attending Oregon State University um, next fall to get a master's in fishery science. Yeah, and I started here in January of this year, and I'll be here until the end of April. Um, I graduated from Humboldt State University in May of 2019, and I have had various positions working with marine wildlife, specifically seabirds, and I hope to continue that and get a master's degree at Oregon State University studying the Brant's Cormorants on the Farallon Islands. Yeah, and also our lab manager, Meredith Elliott, will be joining us in the comments, unfortunately, due to technical difficulties. She won't be here over video today, uh, but keep an eye out for her responses to uh, some of your questions. So yeah, Rebecca and I, we live together here in Petaluma and are considered a family unit, and so that's how we can uh, work in the lab safely under COVID guidelines. Um, the office remains closed to the public, but we look forward to when it can reopen. And yeah, like Rebecca mentioned, our other Facebook live streams are still on uh, Point Blue's Facebook page, so go check those out if you haven't seen those already. Uh, and for those of you who tuned in uh, the last couple ones, we talked about the endangered least tern and the Brant's cormorants diets and how they consume mostly fish. But today we will be talking about uh, another seabird that primarily feeds on zooplankton. So zooplankton are little drifters in the ocean um, and they are consumed by a wide variety of organisms, such as other zooplankton, all the way up to the world's largest animal, the, the blue whale. So these are very important little creatures for marine food webs, um, so that's why we track them. So yeah, usually we go on these access cruises here um, to go <laughs> collect samples of zooplankton in the California current, but due to COVID we were unable to get uh, those samples this year, unfortunately, but that makes the Cassin's Auckland diet a really important thing for us to look at to give us a snapshot into kind of that, the samples we missed, um, and so we can get a better idea of the zooplankton communities um, through diet studies like this. And also the seabird diet studies can help us uh, show or see what the predator-prey relationships are like around, especially the Farallon Islands, 
um, and also the biodiversity in the California current system over a long time scale, which is really cool. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Rebecca to talk about this month's seabird. Yeah, so today we'll be talking about the Cassin's Auklet. This is an island breeding seabird that ranges from Alaska down to Baja California Peninsula. And there's actually a population on the Kuril Islands, which are just northeast of Japan and Russia. And so this is what they look like. They're very small seabirds. They got that um, white stripe above their eye, making them look kind of angry all the time. <laughs> but they're very cute. Um, so yeah, we focus on the population that breeds on the Southeast Farallon Islands. And these birds actually nest underground in burrows that they excavate themselves. So there's a Cassin's Auklet incubating in its burrow. This is a painting kind of showing you how they're underneath and they make that themselves, which is really cool. And so these birds actually lay one egg per season and um, they are among they're rare among seabirds in that they actually can attempt two broods per breeding season, meaning once their first egg is hatched and fledged the nest, they will turn around and lay another egg, and um, hopefully that one is successful as well. And so their main predators are larger birds, um, such as gulls, falcons, and owls. And like you see in this painting, They'll sometimes wait for them outside of those burrows and predate on both the adult and the chick because they're such small birds, which are pretty sad. <laughs> um, but to avoid such predators, the Cassin's auklet will actually feed at night. And another benefit of feeding at night is their preferred prey, the krill, actually migrate up the water column at night. And so Cassin's auklets are expert divers they propel down the water with their wings and forage for uh, mainly krill, but they will eat also larval fish, other zooplankton, mycids, amphipods, and all that good stuff. Um, so here at the Marine Lab, we study their diet through their barf. You guessed it. <laughs> More barf. Um, but yeah, um, biologists on the Farallon Islands will actually hang out near those burrows at night and once they hear a thud, they'll turn on their headlamp and scoop up the bird before it can go down to its burrow. And um, these birds regurgitate their food to their chicks after a night of feeding. However, if intercepted on their way to the nest, they will automatically barf it all up as a defense mechanism. And so these biologists work together to capture as much barf as possible into one of these bags. And sometimes it's a complete sample, meaning we got all that barf. And sometimes it's a partial, meaning some got kind of sprayed everywhere and they didn't collect it all. But either way, we analyze that barf here in the lab just to see um, what they're eating. And Point Blue has been doing this um, year after year. And although it seems kind of like um, a harsh way to collect this data, it does not affect these birds at all. They are determined to raise that chick and um, this, these areas, there are seven that are sampled throughout the island and rotated throughout the season. So the possibility of a bird getting captured twice is pretty rare. So that's good. Point Blue has been studying the Cassin's auklet since the 70s, making this the longest um, zooplanktivorous seabird study in the world, which is very exciting to be a part of. And um, so overall, the Cassin's Auklet are doing pretty well. They are pretty stable over the last 20 years, and um, about 20 pairs actually had that second brood, and 50% were successful this year. And this is likely due to really good ocean conditions and a high abundance of krill out in the ocean this year. So 2020 was a good one for these birds, <laughs> specifically. <laughs> Um, but yeah, having this long data set and seeing how it changes throughout the years really gives us an inside look on how these zooplankton communities are doing and how it ultimately affects the breeding success of these birds. And so with that, I am going to turn it over to Olivia to talk about those zooplankton and how we identify them here in the lab. Yeah, so some zooplankton you may already be familiar with are things like jellyfish, so they kind of drift around with the currents, they can't really swim against the currents. Uh, but some other ones we'll be talking about today 
are kind of the larval stages of other things like cephalopods, also like crabs and shrimp are kind of drifting around in these currents as well. Um, and also we get these copepods and amphipods sometimes. So yeah, these are some of the zooplankton we'll commonly find here. Um, but like Rebecca mentioned, we will be talking mostly about krill today. Um, so krill consume phytoplankton where they come up to the surface at night to feed on phytoplankton, uh, mostly to avoid predators that will normally hunt them during the day. Um, but yeah, so krill have kind of these segmented bodies, you can see here. Uh, this head region is called the cephalothorax, uh, it has like with their gut, um, and then this other, their abdomen region here kind of helps them swim with these legs, they're called pleopods, they kind of swim around by fluttering those little legs around. Uh, and then their tail here, specifically this last bit on the end there called the telson, uh, we will be talking more about later. So yeah, that's the general anatomy of krill. Um, but usually we find two species. Uh, this is a pretty common one called Euphagia pacifica, uh, or EPAC, we'll be calling it. Um, this guy, you can see he has these nice round eyes. Some other krill will have uh, like bilobed eyes or like barrel shaped eyes. This guy has nice round ones. Um, and then also on its carapace here, it'll have this little tooth like projection. It almost looks like a little hook. Um, and it's highlighted in green there, it's really hard to see. Um, but this is really helpful in identifying EPAC for us because it's located in the middle of the carapace, uh, whereas other species might have it more towards the back or uh, no denticle at all. So we'll be pointing that one out. And then also they have this kind of longer six segment here, uh, which can help us uh, distinguish it from another species we commonly find. This is Thysonessa spinifera, or T-spin we'll be calling it. Um, and you can see it kind of has that shorter segment there, and then it also has these spines that run along the back, which is going to be really crucial to identifying this guy. And if you notice, it has this large rostrum that kind of points out above the eye, so it's kind of like the spike, and you can kind of see a better picture there, uh, where it kind of comes out the front of its head. And this guy does not have a denticle, so it's really helpful to identify these two species apart. Um, especially because this guy does not have a rush, and you can see there, it's pretty much a nub. Um, yeah, so that's kind of how we um, identify these, the krill species. And then some other things we'll find, like I mentioned, um, we'll find these larval fish, but they won't be whole, they'll be kind of digested. So when this bird is collecting these things to feed its chick, it's going to be sitting in its gooler pouch, so it'll be kind of broken down by the time it reach, reaches the chick. So we won't be finding whole fish, we'll be finding some pieces such as like their vertebrae. Also, if you tune into our last live streams, the, the fish ear bones or the otoliths sometimes get left in these samples. Um, and then uh, some things like rockfish. Oh, dang. It looks like we're experiencing technical some technical difficulties. Hang um, with us. <laughs> We have it projected on our computer to see how you guys see it. Um, so if this isn't, isn't happening to you guys, let us know. But it looks like we're paused. Yeah. Oh, we're good. You must guys be our see computer. It? Okay. <laughs> Never mind. Um, where was I? Oh yeah. So these fish also some things like rockfish. Um, we'll have these opercular spines that are kind of on the face of the fish, and we can pair these up, and um, that can tell us how many fish this bird ate that day. Um, yeah, and then some other things we'll find sometimes are these mycids. So these also look like um, krill, but they're not krill. They... Uh, There's name we're finding. So okay. <laughs> yeah, so these we'll find these uh, in the years that krill aren't so abundant, so these little mycids. But we probably won't find those in today's sample. But yeah, some challenges that come with looking at these diet studies is that they are partially digested, so things will be kind of all mixed up and broken down a little bit, so you will see that when we bring this over to the microscope, but yeah. And yeah, we want, we always do a little guessing game in these mm -hmm. lives, and we want you guys to guess how many krill we have found in a single sample. 
And so this meat, like Olivia mentioned, they're partially digested. So we pick out the tails and the heads mm. and we take the larger count. Yeah. So it'll be, how many tails did we find? Yeah, <laughs> usually the heads are more digested. Uh, so it's easier to get a count of this little telson part there. So yeah, so, yeah just your ponder that <laughs> while we show you the process and then we'll ask for your um, your guesses at the end of the live. Yeah, so we'll show you the full process. Mm -hmm. Take you over to the fume hood where we process these barf samples. Uh, this is the rest of the lab. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I'm putting on gloves because krill kind of have oils and it can smell really bad and it'll linger on your hands for a long time and then also we're doing this in the fume hood again for more of the smell um, yeah so this is kind of what the samples look like when we first get them they are kept in our freezer but we've thawed this one but yeah it's just kind of like orange mush that's in a little bag so open this guy up and then we'll be rinsing it into this little sieve here uh, has like a little mesh bottom there. So we'll kind of open this up and then we'll use just some water to kind of spray down the sides. Can you see that okay? <laughs> Meredith says the lab is looking good. Wish I was there. <laughs> oh, we miss you, Meredith. <laughs> We got some water in here, mixing it up a little, and then we'll dump this into here. Yeah. Lots of goo. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> and this looks like it was a complete sample, so yeah. we got all that far. <laughs> and this was found at RCC, which I am not sure what that location is. But. <laughs> It's one of yeah. the seven. Yeah, so we'll just rinse this down a little bit because there's lots of usually gunk in there and so it makes the sample really cloudy. So we'll kind of give this a nice rinse. Let that drain a little. Sounds really gross sample. <laughs> yeah, because it's partially digested, there's a, yeah, a lot of gunk. <laughs> That oh, looks like it's clearing up. Brent is asking, did all that come from one bird barf? Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> A single bird barfed all of that up. Yes. Michelle's asking, how do you know if it's a complete or complete sample or not? So our biologists out on the Fairland Islands will record lots of data on these packs and that C means it's a complete sample. If it was a partial, there would be a P right there. Yeah, and that just means they caught whatever the bird threw up and the bird didn't start throwing up before uh, they got its head like kind of in the bag. <laughs> so if anything spilled outside the bag, they consider that a partial, um, but this would have been a complete one, so. Yeah. We also get the sample number, the area caught, the species, and the date it was caught and the weight. So they give us a lot of good info on this pack. Yeah, so I have a little, I'm just gonna dry this off a little. So this is just a small little subsample from our sample there, but we will take this over to the microscope now for you guys to look at. Yes. And we'll flip you guys around. All right. And then I'll be putting some alcohol in this dish um, to kind of preserve the sample as we go through it. All right. How's that looking for everybody? Sing out a little bit. Alright, so this is an up-close view of partially digested krill. So we will go through all of this looking for 
um, identifiable parts, such as a telson, which is the tail of a krill. There she is. Let me zoom in for you guys. So yeah, that is a tail of a krill. And so we will pull out each one of those into a smaller dish. And um, they do not tell us what species, but um, if there is just one species in the sample, for instance, teaspoon, we usually just have teaspoon in our samples, we can conclude that this is indeed from a teaspoon. So let's look for some heads that can show us some species characteristics. Um, this is very digested. Yeah, these are just body parts. Um, oh, here we go. So this is a teaspoon head. And remember Olivia mentioned that these guys have this very pointy rostrum. I know it doesn't look like a head, because there's no eyes, but um, yeah, the eyes would be like down here. And this is their very pointy rostrum that is very definitive of being a teaspoon, <clears throat> which is a species of krills. Um, it's Thynonessa spinifera. We just shorten it to teaspoon to make it easier. And so, yeah, we would take out this head and put it in a teaspoon specific dish to be counted later. Yeah, so Jeannie asks, how are these samples stored and are they simply refrigerated and for how long? When was the sample collected? Yeah, so these were frozen um, previously and this one was from this year, uh, looks like July 20th, but these can stay in the freezer for several years um, so we can take a look Ooh. at them. But Here's a good head. Oh, yeah. Its eyes are still intact. Yeah, you can see that rostrum pretty clearly. Um, these are pretty big. Teaspoon are usually bigger than mm -hmm. EPAC. Um, and if we do find a whole krill, we will measure it. And that kind of gives us an idea of the age class that these krill are. So we record that as well just to get a better idea of those communities. So yeah, mm -hmm. some more tails, whole body parts. Let's see if we can get those spines in view. Oh, yeah. So yeah, there's that spine that comes off of the back of T-spin, which is a very distinct characteristic of Thysano Essa spinifera. <laughs> so um, yeah, just a reminder, T-spin is a species of krill. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, we go through this whole thing. This is just a portion of that sample that Olivia washed. So both her and I will go through and pick out each part, like a tail, head, even sometimes the rostrums are just floating around, um, which we can count as a head. Mm -hmm. And then we label what species each head is from. And then if there are two species in a sample, for instance, teaspoon and EPAC, and the tails are larger, we take the difference of um, the head count of a teaspoon and an EPAC. Yeah, and the rest is just labeled like krill spa, basically, yeah. so we can't determine what species it came from because the telsons generally look the same between species. Yeah. Yeah, and usually teaspoon is thought to be uh, more nutritious for these birds because they have a higher fat content. And also the teaspoon adults are typically larger than um, the EPAC adults. So Yeah, and we've been finding a lot of teaspoon, which is a very good sign. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've been Austin. finding a lot of like immature and juvenile range uh, teaspoon. So hopefully they grow up to be nice big adults soon. <laughs> yeah, so now we're gonna look at some, a sample that has been, um, analyzed already just to give you an idea so here we have 
all of the tails from one sample. So yeah, we pick out <laughs> each one of these telsins um, and put it in its own little dish. Mm -hmm. And then we add up both of our counts and that's our telson count. So yeah, lots of little tails. They're actually really easy to see in a sample. So this looks um, harder than it is. <laughs> This is T-spin heads, so these, you can see these little pointy parts. These are the rostrums that have broken off, and so we can assume <laughs> that that came from a T-spin head. <laughs> Quinn says, they're kind of cute. Yeah, we <laughs> love are. krill. I love krill. <laughs> Zooplankton is probably my favorite thing to look at. So yeah, those are those pointy rostrums. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so we do take a heads and a tail count, but like we said, the tail count's usually higher, so we go with that one for the number of krill that was in a sample. Yes, Michelle, this is all from one sample. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, so now we'll show you some fish parts so that we, we didn't find. see any fish in the last sample, but... So we'll also pull out um, the vertebrae that we find. And these are those percular spines that Olivia was mentioning that are on some species of fish. And like otoliths, fish have a pair. So that can give us a better count of how many fish this bird ate when we find pairs of those. Yeah, and those, those vertebrae are those little circles that you see in yeah. the thing. And they're really tiny. Uh, some of them are crazy and they have these like wacky little things that come off the side there that's a vertebrae yeah There's these another one are harder to um pull out of a sample mm -hmm. but yeah meredith says a percular spines probably rockfish yeah Special. yeah that's what we're guessing um see there's a pair mm -hmm. yeah and usually like there's different kinds of a perculum spines that we find in here um, some have more like spiny parts, some have these longer um, spines like you see in there. But yeah, but yeah there's the fish, fish parts that we record. Mm -hmm. Do anthropods? Sure, and then... Oh, we should do EPAC. Oh yeah, let's do EPAC. Do we have any oh, heads? Yeah, heads. Heads. This might be a little harder to... So this is that other species that we were talking about. Uh, this, this is EPAC. Is... And we're going to try to show you the denticles, but they're really Let's tiny, see. so keep an eye out for them. Um, um, zoom. Find a good one to unravel. <laughs> Mishka says, I want a percular spine-inspired earrings. Yeah, I think they're very cool. All the fish mm -hmm. parts, like the otolith earrings, are super cool. Ooh, there's a denticle. Oh, yeah. Okay, so... Do you guys see that little... <laughs> Kind of hard to tell. Wave. Stuck to my finger. Point at it with your. So yeah, this is what we look for for EPAC. Where's my finger? There. <laughs> so small. This is very difficult. Um, hold on. Let me see if I can find another one. Yeah, and Meredith clarified in the notes, uh, EPAC is Euphasia pacifica. This is our most common species off the coast. Oh, Lishka sees it. Great. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> yeah. They're pretty. They're really small. Ah, there, there we go. It is. Zoom. Zoom. <laughs> and these guys don't have that pointy rostrum like T-spin has. So if we find a head that doesn't have the rostrum, we look at this part of the head for that denticle. But sometimes mm -hmm. they're not there. And then yeah. we're like, is this EPAC? Is this another species? Mm -hmm. So it does pose some challenges in the lab. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> and there's a head with some eyes. Yeah, and this is, this is probably more difficult for you guys to look at, but we've been kind of trained by looking at our zooplankton samples from the access cruises where we do get these whole krill. Mm -hmm. um, but which is actually going to be our next live stream. We'll be talking about those samples and how we identify the krill there but yeah so you'll get to see whole krill whole not krill. digested krill yeah but those often have the zoea so the larval or like the baby stages of krill which mm -hmm. can make them harder to identify and they have even tinier denticles which is 
really challenging. <laughs> yeah. Someone's asking if we ever find plastic, and we do. Oh, yeah. Where was that one? Oh, okay. yeah. Actually, recently, we've been finding quite More a few plastic. plastic fibers, which are those little pieces right there. Oh, Jeannie says, yeah, what's the most interesting item you've seen in Aklet Barf, which we'll show you after this, and then do you ever find plastic debris? <laughs> yes. So, so, yeah, those little fibers um, are indeed yeah. plastic. Mm -hmm. And I think there was a purple one in there, too. Yeah. yeah. And we can probably assume that these might have been eaten um, kind of as bycatch, as the, the seabirds foraging for food. I doubt it can see these fibers and pick them out. Um, as mistaken as prey and then sometimes also this these little fibers are consumed by the krill themselves mm -hmm. and then therefore is consumed by the auklet um, but yeah so so krill feed by kind of like filtering the water with these little um, little basket arms and they can <laughs> um, feed it into their stomach that way and so sometimes plastic gets trapped in there which is kind of really important to know um, especially when studying these because as you can see this bird you know ate maybe about a hundred krill and so therefore a hundred krills worth of plastic is going to be in this one bird and so it amplifies through the food chain which is really scary to think about yeah uh, I think Meredith's oh, Meredith said we should say that the plastic may or may not have come from the Cassin's awkward gut there's possibility of little bits of plastic from our clothing the bags etc mm -hmm. Yeah, that too. That's a big thing with plastic mm -hmm. studies. <laughs> the, yeah. There's plastic flying around everywhere, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we're going to show you the most interesting thing that we found actually yesterday. Um, we had a whole sample full of these guys, which are amphipods, mm -hmm. which are like the bugs of the ocean, essentially. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, just look at its head at the bottom there. It's so weird. <laughs> yeah, it's got all these segments. Let's try to get it on its belly. Oh, little roaches, I know. Yeah. <laughs> and they have these, like, weird things on their, their face. face. Yeah, and that's, like, that dark patch is their eye. Yeah, they're so, so crazy. They're so crazy looking. And there's so many different kinds of amphipods. Like, they come in all sorts of little crazy morphologies. Yeah. Um, if you've seen the movie Aliens, that alien in there was actually based off of an amphipod that sometimes we find. Um, so they are, like, crazy looking, but fear not, they're really tiny and harmless. <laughs> um, Jade's thesis revolves around amphipods. What? Wow. I gotta read that. Because we, we had, what, like, 80 in the sample yesterday? Mm -hmm. Of these so guys. So many. <laughs> yeah. But among these, there was this guy who looks it's quite different. Yeah. Looks kind of like a rocket ship. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, so we were kind of confused, and we, like, sent the picture out to some experts, and it turns out it's not actually an amphipod. Can anybody guess what it is before we <laughs> tell you? Any zooplanktivorous experts? It's not a krill, and it's not an amphipod. Oh, its eyes look like yeah. lit up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, maybe flip it over so you can see the underside. Yeah. yeah. Crazy. It's got this crazy underside, and it's pretty flat. Yeah, so. and like really cool tail <laughs> Quinn looking. says, whoa, that one's scary looking. <laughs> yeah, we were like, what the heck is this? Yeah. It was quite fun, because we mm -hmm. usually just get teaspoon. <laughs> mm -hmm. But, yeah, I don't think anyone's going to guess no, it, because we didn't even know. It's actually a species of copepod. Yeah, and it hangs out on sharks and rays. Mm -hmm. um, kind of parasitic. <laughs> yeah, and that you can kind of tell... I guess before we knew what it was, that it it was kind of a parasite because of how, like, flat it is mm -hmm. and, the like, the fringes. underside. Yeah, so kind of when you see something flat like this, they kind of suck onto other things and go along for the ride. So this yeah. guy was probably on a shark <laughs> or a ray. Or it was leaving a shark to go to another shark, and then mm -hmm. the Cassin's Aqualit just ate it up. Yeah. <laughs> so they don't normally so go after crazy. these, so... 
It was definitely bycatch of some sort. Oh, Alicia says, what is a copepod? That is oh. a species of zooplankton. <laughs> or a class. <laughs> Family. Yeah. I'm not sh- yeah, exactly. But they kind of, there's freshwater copepods and there's saltwater copepods. Uh, they're kind of like little bugs. Yeah. There's a lot like, of species. A lot of little bugs in the sea. Um, <laughs> but yeah, these like copepods usually have a uh, high lipid or fat content. Um, so sometimes the uh, the species in Northern California or the Cassin's aquas in Northern California actually like feed Canada. on uh, the copepods that come down from Alaska, which are a lot bigger than the ones we get. Uh, and so that's really cool that, that copepods are the main source of their diet versus krill. Yeah. So I think so, that was everything to show mm-hmm. you on the microscope. So we're gonna switch over and answer some of your questions. Oh. <laughs> <Is that it? laughs> oh. <laughs> Tripod. Yeah. I wanna hit that. Sorry about that. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah, do you have any questions? Um remember to be thinking about how many individual krill we have found in a single sample. What's your guesses? And fun fact, this is actually the first year that we are doing this project here in the lab. Mm -hmm. We used to send these barf samples to a zooplankton expert who lives in Canada. Um, But just to speed things up, we um, are doing it here. So Olivia and I had to kind of have some trial and error. We kind Mm -hmm. of with Meredith's help, of course, we kind of <laughs> formulated the protocol for this study, which will be continued throughout the years when we're gone, yeah. um, <laughs> which is really exciting mm-hmm. to be like spearheading a yeah. project here in the marine lab for Point Blue. Yeah, it's very exciting, especially because zooplankton are probably my, it's probably my favorite um, study to look at. Yeah, they're just so interesting. There's just like so many weird things that you find, and Mm -hmm. it's like, it's, there's so much like discovery with every sample, which is so cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So do you guys have any questions about the process, about the auklets? Doug Um, says, uh, where are you? Students? Sorry, we missed the beginning. (laughs) We Uh, are both college graduates. Mm -hmm. Uh, We're employed by Point Blue, Mm -hmm. um, but we have a certain period that we are here. It's not a long-term position. Mm -hmm. So both of us are looking to continue our education after this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's (laughs) Um, the next step. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. so we will be students again soon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I went to California State University, Monterey Bay, uh, which you may know is associated with the Monterey Bay Aquarium, so very marine focused there, Mm -hmm. Um, but I actually did uh, chem- marine chemistry research when I was there, but I love the biology aspects of this lab and it's very exciting for me. Yeah, and I went to Humboldt State University, got a degree in wildlife biology and a minor in philosophy. So yeah. <laughs> I love wildlife, specifically seabirds, that mm-hmm. is my passion, so I'm very happy yeah. to be here. Alishka asks, um, how do these types of studies help to protect and conserve the ocean? Good question. Yeah, so these are long-term studies. Like Rebecca mentioned, this is like the longest study of a zooplanktivorous seabird in the world. So that can really help us track these changes over time and what they're foraging for and how that relates to their breeding success and their overall populations is really important for us to know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess we talked about the endangered least tern um, a couple live streams ago. So just understanding um, how their diet really impacts their breeding success for all birds, not just endangered birds, uh, is really important, especially in a time of climate change. Um, We definitely see, or Point Blue sees, um, some rises and falls in um, breeding success of these birds, and I think that that really has to do with the food availability for them. Mm -hmm. Um, Just for instance, we um, finished off the 2019 Cassin's Auklet diet study um, a few months ago, and we got primarily mycids, which are in the same class as krill, but they 
are not the preferred prey, so something was going on where the krill was absent, so they had to resort to mycids, which aren't necessarily less nutritious, it's just it's not their preferred prey. So something's going on in the ocean, mm -hmm. but um, due to very good ocean conditions this year, from upwelling and very nutritious waters, krill are back. So <laughs> these birds are now eating their preferred prey again. And yeah. so having that data set is really important so we can see those mm -hmm. um, waves in um, food availability and how it relates to breeding success totally. of seabirds. Yeah, and going back to our access cruises that we missed this year, I was really sad because I was supposed to go out on those this summer. Um, but yeah, like we saw record numbers of humpback whales off the Farallon Islands, which they eat mostly krill too. Mm -hmm. So this year, this year, I was really bummed we couldn't go out there and collect those samples. But looking at these diet samples um, is really crucial to just tracking everything, especially in years like this where we might have missed some data. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, Lishka says, how does this work fit into Point Blue's overall mission? Well, um, Point Blue, we're all about conserving nature and wildlife. <laughs> and so understanding those um, changes in the ocean, and how it relates to breeding productivity. Um, sometimes there can be protections placed in certain areas. Um, like say off the Farallons, the crow populations are doing so well, maybe um, human boating around that area is affecting the crow. This is just hypothetical, I have no <laughs> idea. But then protections can be placed where there is restrictive access, human access around those areas, which can maybe help those um, zooplankton communities. So just things like that, understanding mm -hmm. what's going on, how um, it can be mitigated and such just to conserve nature and wildlife as best as possible. And we do that through yeah. the science here at Point Blue. Totally. Yeah, and Point Blue as an organization uh, loves to partner with other local agencies and government agencies to make this happen. So um, it's really important to have all these pieces put in place um, mm -hmm. before we can get a full picture of really what's happening in the world uh, as a whole. So. We're lucky to be part of that. Yeah, yeah totally. <laughs> good so, questions. Yeah, you good guys. questions. Um, with we're gonna that, put we... up this donate link one more time because this is a nonprofit organization. We rely mm -hmm. on donations um, to continue this work to conserve both our oceans and our lands. <laughs> yeah, totally. And then if you all have that idea of how many uh, krill was the most krill in one sample that we found this mm -hmm. year, you can put that in the comments. So. Give us your number, what you think of the most krill in one sample. Yeah, found, and it was a tail count for a tail teaspoon. Count. Right, teaspoon? I think it might have been both. No, I think it was just teaspoon. Oh, just teaspoon. <laughs> yeah. um, so give us your answers. How many tails did we one seven pick out? Seven. Good guess. <laughs> but higher. Yeah. <laughs> um, average, Ooh. 100. Jane says 1,300. Sarah says 250. Nice. 245. Angela, 245. 3,000, right? Wow. <laughs> 2,000 from Doug. 500. 000. Good, 000. good guesses, you guys. Yeah. Um, Why don't you reveal it? <laughs> Olivia and I <laughs> have picked out 1,153 tails from a single sample. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think Jade's the sample. closest. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was like yeah. incredibly close. <laughs> <laughs> he knows his yeah. seabirds. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, totally. So yeah, that was a long day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sometimes these yeah. samples can take mm -hmm. up to a couple days or maybe just an hour. Mm -hmm. um, as we go through, we are getting better at it. <laughs> yeah. We started with 100 samples and we are at 55 mm -hmm. left for this year. Ah, that's very exciting. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you all for tuning in. And we hope to see you next month for our live stream about uh, our zooplankton samples. So our jars of zooplankton and how mm -hmm. we go through them. So yeah, join yeah, us next Thank you month. so much, thank you guys. Thank you so much for your support. Yeah. We really appreciate exciting. your support. 
and we look forward to seeing you next time and have a safe and happy holidays yeah. and we'll see you in the next year yeah wow 2021 right, bye thank you everybody <laughs> goodbye